Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, September 3rd, 2009. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, home brewer Greg Peach sits in to talk about a branch of the hobby that he's exploring, yeast ranching. Yeehaw! Insert your western-themed pun here. Uh, Yeast ranching is essentially starting a collection of the little critters that you can use to brew up a batch of beer or to share with your homebrew buddies. If you're new to homebrewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And you can follow me on Twitter. My username is basicbrewing, all one word. Also, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. We also have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook. And if you become a fan of the show there, I'll be sending out occasional notices when shows are posted and such as that. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us and click on our associate link first. It won't cost you any extra And you'll be helping us to bring you the show. And we appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site as well. I took gravity readings of the three two-gallon batches of barley wine that I'm brewing to take part in the Brew Your Own Magazine Basic Brewing Radio Collaborative Experiment that's going on right now. I did that, uh, took those gravity readings this past weekend. You might... Recall that I I pitched two grams of dry yeast into one of the two-gallon batches, six grams into another, and 24 into the third. The starting gravity of the little barley wine, by the way, was 1079. I'm not going to tell you what the gravity was at uh, a week after pitching, but I, I, I will say that I was surprised. That's all I'm going to say planning to bottle this upcoming weekend so be plenty of time to uh, evaluate to let the bottle bottles bottle condition before it's time to evaluate i hope that you're taking part in the experiment the deadline to report your data is september 30th so you still have time you can check out chris colby's blog at byo.com slash blogs for details on the experiment procedure and uh, we're trying to see what varying pitching rates will do to uh, identical batches of wort. And uh, as of right now, I apologize, I don't have the uh, online entry form up yet, but I hope to have that soon, maybe even by the time you listen to this. And you'll be able to find a link to that at basicbrewingradio.com. So take good notes on all of your process right now, and then uh, by the time it's done, hopefully... The data form will be up there that you can send us your stuff. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing and and seeing and tasting the results of the experiment. Uh, A lot of you have asked if we're going to the uh, Great American Beer Festival this year, and I've decided to do something different. Uh, I don't want to get burned out on GABF, number one. And uh, number two, I want to spend our travel budget in the best way possible to kind of widen our horizons, you know, to see what's out there in the beer and homebrew world, and to get content for you that you haven't heard or seen before. We've been to the Great American Beer Festival uh, three times, I believe. And, uh, you know, it's it's an amazing thing to go to. So you won't see us there, but next year we'll probably be back. Uh, So uh, where we will go this year, Andy Sparks and I are headed to the uh, northwest part of the country next week. Portland, in fact. We're headed up to that area of the world to take part in Hop Madness. If you listen to the archives, you've heard uh, Dave Wills from Fresh Hops talk about the event. It takes place at uh, Willamette Mission State Park. Homebrewers gather there to camp, brew, trade homebrews, and tour a hop production facility. So that should be incredible. It's going to be on uh, Saturday, September 12th. You can go to hopmadness.com to find out more information. If you're in the area, I hope to see you there. It should be fun. Also, we're flying into uh, Portland next Thursday evening, so 
Uh, we'll have a couple of nights in the area to explore the beer culture up there. I'll be tweeting and Facebooking wherever we go. So, again, hope to see you around. And uh, Steve Wilkes and I will be in Tulsa a week later, the 19th. We've been recruited by Desiree and Dave of High Gravity to take part in the Foam Cup. We're excited about that. It's just a short hop over to Tulsa for us. And uh, we hope to see some of you there. Enough travel news. Let's take a look in the uh, mailbag. Got some good letters following our episode last time on the strawberry beer experiment. If you listened to last, uh, last week's show, home brewer Matt Troutman put strawberries in at the end of the boil and in the secondary. And uh, we found a hint of some possible infection in, in the one where the fruit was added in the carboy. It was tasty, but still just kind of a little bit of a plasticky thing going on there. Uh, David from Corvallis, Oregon writes, One thing that I do to prevent a contamination is to add my fruit during high croissant. I mostly use cherries as my fruit and have never had an infect, uh, contamination. In fact, I have a two-year-old cherry beer that still tastes great. Uh, David says, this also makes sure that there are no leftover sugars to prevent foamers in the bottle. One thing to warn people about is when you add fruit at high croissant, it will foam like crazy. All the simple sugars in the fruit are giving, uh, like giving the yeast crack or something. <laughs> But all this activity should overwhelm any bugs that may be on the fruit. Well, you talk to uh, talk to Steve Wilkes about adding fruit in the primary. Woo! His peach beer. It was messy, but boy, was it good. Uh, appreciate that, David. Derek from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, writes, You mentioned Randy Mosher discouraging uh, the use of strawberries in beer, but were unsure as to why. In Radical Brewing, page 176, he states that strawberries are almost hopeless, losing all their color and much of their flavor within a month or two. Uh, on page 175, he also recommends using either strawberries you picked yourself or frozen two pounds per gallon or more. Over time, the strawberry flavor fades, leaving an orangish-hued, vaguely fruity beer behind. So his recommendations are be sure of strawberry quality, use lots of them, and drink the beer as young as possible. He mentions nothing of other flavors developing over time. Derek says maybe Matt should continue to test this beer periodically and see if the strawberry flavor continues to fade or otherwise change in character. Thanks, Derek. I do have a copy of Radical Brewing, but I was either too lazy or... Forgot to look up the reference before recording the interview. <laughs> Pick your excuse. Probably a little of both. I appreciate your not being lazy, Derek, and and uh, sending that in as a reminder. Charles writes in with this, Having made strawberry mead, adding berries in the secondary, there's a lot of flavor changes from very sour to plastic to funk that fades to a very nice flavor. The overcarbonation is, in my humble opinion, Charles says, due to, like you said, insufficient yeast in the secondary. Uh, Charles says, I'd recommend if the strawberry beer isn't great right off, wait a long time and it'll get better if you don't get bombs out of it. So there's, a, there's something from the opposite side of the fence. Randy Mosier says, drink them fresh. And Charles says, wait a while. So maybe you save some for both. Drink some now, save some for later. Thanks, Charles. Rob from Wisconsin writes, As I listen to your podcast about strawberries, the first thing that comes to mind is my winemaking experience. We, my wife and I, have made a few fresh fruit wines, and with those we let the fruits soak in water and Camden tablets for 24 hours to kill uh, any bacteria. This might help with their fruit beers. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I did read a note after the interview uh, from Joe in Delaware, Ohio, who said he had done that with one Camden tablet overnight with a fruit, but maybe more than one is needed. Finally, on a different topic from the mailbag, Gail from San Francisco writes, after perusing the archives, Gail says, I also listened to your older segment with Rick Sellers interviewing Beth Zangery about the Queen of Beer competition and I wanted to just pass the word that the deadline for QOB is coming up again. Just Google Queen of Beer. 
It's a wonderful tradition worth supporting by women brewers, by entering some beers or convincing the women you know to enter a beer. Quick Brewers can still make up a competition beer in time using insights from the podcast on making beers more quickly. And for women brewers who can't have something ready in time this September, starting a barley wine or lambic for Queen of Beer 2010 is a worthy project, too. Enter to win or get top-notch feedback on your brews or both. Thanks, Gail. Appreciate that. We need more women home brewers, definitely. After all, the more brewers, the more beer. After all. One more quick thing. There is a new episode of Basic Brewing Video out there in the most recent episode, uh, otherwise known as episode. I show the damage that Japanese beetles can do to uh, Cascade hops, unfortunately. But there is good news. Steve and I sampled a uh, pale ale that I made with seven ounces of homegrown hops from the freezer last year's harvest. So... Uh, and there's lots of good advice on our Facebook page uh, from uh, brewers uh, who have suffered from Japanese beetles. So check that out as well. Appreciate everybody uh, taking part in the feedback there. Um, we To get on with the, the show for this week, we've done a show in the past on advanced yeast handling, but it's been more than a year since we've done so. On the uh, February 7th, 2008 episode, home brewer Anthony Fisher did a great job of walking us through the advanced techniques that he uses to culture and even freeze yeast samples. However, I feel it's a, it's a topic that's worth visiting again, since yeast is such an important part of our, of our hobby, and we may want to culture our own samples. Uh, when I saw a picture that Greg, uh, Greg Peach posted of his yeast ranging efforts on our Facebook page, I was very interested in his approach to taming our favorite fungi. Well, Greg Peach, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Hi, James. Thanks for having me on. You are another in a, in a string of uh, interviews that we've had lately of uh, home brewers who also has a background in science, right? That's right. Um, I'm a veterinarian, so I've spent lots of time uh, in school and doing various science projects and, and use science in my daily life. And uh, tell us about your uh, your brewing background. What kind of beers do you like to brew, and how long have you been brewing? I, I tend to like to brew uh, session-type beers, usually mid- to low-gravity beers, and, and usually English ale-type things. Uh, I've been brewing since probably about 1992, and originally started doing uh, extract batches, and now I am doing uh, all grain. And uh, it's kind of hit or miss over the years how much I brew. And the last couple of years I've been, been brewing more and, and getting more into it, refining my, my system and, and techniques and getting a little bit more into the technical side of things. And recently you started uh, getting into yeast ranching, and uh, <sighs> you've coincidentally started a, a blog at the same time. And and it, tell us the address of your blog and, and why you decided to get into that aspect of brewing. So the the blog is Saccharomyces Safari. Um, it's at Blogspot. And the Yeast Ranch kind of came about um, from some discussions with my homebrew club. I, I think we had a, a tasting that maybe went a little longer than it should, and we started talking about developing a yeast library and and how it might be fun to, to collect yeast that we could save and reuse later and just, you know, share with each other as a group. And somehow I was the one who decided that that actually was a good idea. <laughs> you were sitting closest to the keg, probably. Uh, apparently. <laughs> now, I, I tweeted out there, uh, that I was going to be talking to a, uh, a home brewer about getting into yeast ranching uh, and ask for questions. And, and oh, the home brewers are a clever lot. Uh, you know, they, there was everything from how big are the lassos to, you know, what kind of saddles do you put on the, you know, 
uh, I guess a Monday morning is 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 a good time to you know bring out this smart aleckiness in uh, in the listeners out there. Uh, but I got uh, several uh, questions, and the, and the first one that I want to ask is. Uh, Big Kahuna Brew asks, is yeast ranching cost-effective or just part of the obsession? Yeah, it's, it's definitely part of the obsession. Um, it, it's not a real expensive thing to do, but then again, neither is buying a uh, nice fresh smack pack or, or vial of yeast. Um, but it's, it's something I started doing mostly because I'm a little bit geeky and, and have an interest in the the technical aspects of things, and um, just thought I would enjoy doing. Now, what what kinds of uh, what kinds of yeasts have you collected so far, and and what are your goals? I have collected. Well, let's see. I I have six yeasts uh, currently that I have cultured, and they're mostly um, British ale yeasts. I have one Belgian strain, which I actually like quite a bit, and just brewed an IPA um, off the plate last weekend, and that is coming along quite nicely. Um, but the goals are, are kind of to just see what what I can collect and how many I can keep going, and to be a source for, for my friends in the home, group, home brew club to see if they want uh, to ever use any, just to whip up a starter for them and... and share it and in turn they have been giving me cultures from their um, brewing when we get together yeah that was going to be my next question is what where are your sources where are you getting these yeast strains they're they're so far everything i have are either white labs or y yeast strains and and we've either been getting them out of a a vial as we're opening it or a lot of them we've taken out of um, bottles after we've um, finished one or out of carboys after the fermentation. So it's, it's kind of been hit or miss depending on how prepared I am to get a sample. Mm-hmm. So you can get yeast from several sources. Yeah, there's, there's yeast everywhere, and it's really the trick is just trying to make sure that you're not getting contamination. Um, so we definitely don't sample out of bottles that we've been drinking directly out of. <laughs> There's no telling uh, <laughs> what you might find there. Uh, and that's a, that's a question, another question from uh, 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 KG, the, the uh, free-range librarian, who, uh, <laughs> whom I follow and uh, enjoy her posts. Uh, she says, uh, how do you keep the bad bugs out when you're collecting a sample? That's a good question. Um, the The trick is keeping everything as as clean as possible. Um, so what I purchased was a, a small alcohol lamp and just a little uh, metal inoculation loop. And so what I'll do is um, I can, if I'm getting it out of a bottle of, of homebrew, uh, I'll flame the lips of, of the bottle with the alcohol burner and I'll flame the the wire loop um, until it's glowing red hot, just so anything that might be on there is, is burned off and, and dead. And just try to um, insert that loop down into the the dregs of the the bottle, and try not to hit anything on the outside of the bottle on the way down, and then streaking it out onto um, onto a plate. Or if you're not putting them onto plates and you're doing it just into a a wart sample that you have in in another bottle or a mason jar, you know, trying to just make sure the the edges are are sterilized with with a flame and and pour carefully, trying not to to splash it around. So you can you can get away with not buying uh, laboratory equipment and such as that at least at first. Yeah, my equipment. Um, I, I got some of the, the homebrew, or a lot of the different homebrew uh, supply shops carry some of the basic equipment. The alcohol burner is, is nice. Um, uh, you could really use any any flame, but that's just a convenient, cheap, and easy uh, 
little source of heat that I can set out on my kitchen table and um, flame it and some rubbing alcohol from the pharmacy. And I'm pretty good to go apart from needing my, my plates. I, the question about making sure you don't get um, contaminants in there, that's where where I like to use the, the plates because then I know I'm getting yeast only um, because I can see each individual little colony that I get. Mm-hmm. So you can, if you go uh, from, say, a bottle of beer uh, or a, a fermenter or another source uh, into, say, a, a small starter, mm-hmm. you're not 100% sure that, that what you've got in there is what you want. That's right. Um, and, I, and I've done that, and that, that works great most of the time. Um, but you do, over time, run the risk of, of something floating in there during your sampling procedure, and, and at some point you, you may get a contaminant um, versus getting things onto a, a plate. You may get contaminants, but you can see that as a separate colony and then resample your good colonies um, to purify your source again. Huh. So uh, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, what are we talking about as far as the basic equipment that you would recommend uh, if we want to get started in this? The basic equipment, um, as I mentioned, is a little alcohol burner, um, inoculation loop, which I, I like the, the metal ones. You can also buy disposable pre-sterilized ones, and um, some Petri dishes uh, with a malt agar mix um, as a culture media, which you can purchase um, pre-made at, at a lot of the homebrew um, shops online, or you can... Um, get sterilized plates and, and just make them up yourself. And you can either buy uh, glass plates if you've got some some way to sterilize them, or you can buy <clears throat> or you can buy uh, disposable plastic uh, pre-sterilized ones, right? That's right. Yeah. So if you if you don't want to invest in say a pressure cooker, or if you don't have access to an an uh, autoclave, say if you don't work in a uh, an establishment that has one, uh, <laughs> and it's very handy. Yeah, that may be the way to go. So, so if you've got, uh, say, like a pre-made, uh, uh, you know, auger plate, uh, and you streak your loop across the uh, across the medium and mm-hmm. let it grow, how can you tell if you've got an infection, and and how can you tell the bad stuff from the good stuff just by looking at it? Well, I mean, the first the first thing is just looking for anything that's different. So if one thing doesn't look like another, it's probably a problem. So that that makes it easy. Um, the yeast colonies are are usually um, white and round, slightly raised off the plate. Um, if you get other molds, um, you'll you'll tend to see things that look like bread mold, mm. um, something green and fuzzy. Um, that looks like it doesn't belong, um, and and in the bacterial um, colonies oftentimes will have a, a more shiny appearance and, and will just look different than the the yeast. So, really, the nice thing is most of your colonies should look pretty much identical, and if you see something different, you've you've picked up something. Do you need a microscope for something like this? No, that's something. It's just just visual. Just holding it in your hand, you can you can look and and see if anything looks abnormal. Now, you, you could potentially have different colonies of different strains of yeast, and they may look the same. So, it's possible you could pick up different strains of yeast on the plate, and that might be harder to tell apart without a microscope. But in terms of a bacterial infection or or some of the bad stuff you don't want. Um, those are, are pretty easy to, to pick up. Now, if you if you wanted to, if you didn't want to go the you know the, the petri dishes and the you know the lab equipment sort of uh, way, uh, is it practical to have sort of a a collection or a library of, of yeasts uh, you know in small starters in the fridge? Oh, sure, that that works works great too. Um, 
there's a little bit more chance of, of picking up some sort of contaminant because you can't see all the various different cells that are in there. You can't see those colonies. But that works works great. Um, and and you just, you know, can keep keep using them until you start having problems. Hmm. What's the viability on, say, a, uh, a yeast that's on a, on a Petri dish and versus uh, uh, one that's, say, in a, in a mason jar or something like that? And, and uh, you don't freeze yours, right? You just keep yours in the fridge. I just keep mine in the fridge. Uh, I worry about freezing them that, that I might actually destroy some of the cells and, and lose viability. Um, but I've had some plates going for probably about five months now and just last last weekend we brewed up a a big batch and I actually supplied uh, yeast starters for for three of the batches and I think overnight each one of the ones that that I had grown the yeast up for managed to blow its airlock off so <laughs> it seemed pretty viable <laughs> something's going right there or horribly yeah. wrong. Uh, <laughs> I, I was fairly fairly happy in the morning, mostly because it was in my basement and not a big deal to clean up. <laughs> so, uh, so if you if you streak a a, a yeast sample onto a, a petri dish, uh, how do you you don't throw it into the fridge just then? How do you handle it, right? Right. So I'll I'll streak out a sample onto onto a plate, and um, and that's something I had sort of learned in, in school how to do, um, but it's there's lots of videos on places like YouTube that kind of show you how to do it. Um, it's pretty easy to do once you learn the technique, but I will streak something out and then just set it out. Um, uh, I keep mine in, in my kitchen because it's nice and warm, and wait until I start to see growth, and usually probably four to seven days I will start to see some some colonies forming and once I I feel like I've had some good growth and and everything looks okay no contaminants I will put it in the fridge where it can stay nice and and cool and and hopefully viable hmm. and is that uh, and that's a good storage uh, solution for you uh, you of course you got to make sure that it's sealed when you put it in the fridge so you, that you don't get bugs from all the other food in there. Yeah, the certainly if I was doing this on a commercial basis, my fridge probably wouldn't be the best place for it. <laughs> but I just wrap my, my Petri dishes in saran wrap, and that so far it's been working well for me. I haven't had anything creep in there. Now, uh, I got another question from Tim in Auburn, Pennsylvania. Um, what's your recipe for... Uh, a starter uh, to inoculate uh, when you first, you know, when you first get these colonies and want to use them from the fridge, you've got a very, very small sample there. Uh, what's your, how do you how do you build that up into a pitchable amount, and what's your recipe and, and technique for doing that? So I will usually um, make up just a teeny little bit of of wart. Um, in the 1030 to 1040 range and I have some um, just small little glass test tubes that I will sterilize and I'll put about 10 ml of, of wort into those and I will collect a harvester colony off the plate so I'll just flame my loop get it sterile pull the colony off and and add that into my little 10 ml starter and Usually, pretty quickly, you'll start to see just like a little mini fermentation going on, and you can watch a little yeast pellet develop in there. And after after a few days, once it looks like it's been building up, then I'll move up um, into a couple hundred mLs, um, give that a, a few more days, and make sure everything looks like it's it's going well and fermenting happily. And then I'll move up to my final starter size, which is usually between 500 to 700 mLs, um, give or take, depending on, on my mood when I make it. Mm -hmm. So it, I will usually 
try to start about a week before I need it. So that that's where it's much easier to go out and buy some, uh, like a snack pack, because um, you don't need to be quite so organized to get your timing right. Mm-hmm. Now, is there is there a magic formula where uh, you you don't want to you don't want to overpower your little yeast? Um, you know, if you if you pitch just a small amount of yeast in a big starter, you're going to get undesirable results, right? So, is there is there a magic formula that that you use to kind of figure out how big to step up into the next stage? I don't have. I don't have a, a set formula, but I, I tend to to think I can go up maybe by by power of ten. So if I have ten mLs, I can easily I think go up to 100 mLs and and potentially then take that to a liter. Um, although I, I don't do starters quite that big. Hmm. How long do you think that you can uh, save like a, a petri dish? Uh, in the fridge, and and do you think that it would uh, be different if you had like a mason jar uh, with some yeast cake in it? Because Dan in Buffalo is asking, how long can you keep a mason jar of yeast in the fridge? Because uh, he he has some Irish ale yeast from last July that he's skeptical of. So <laughs> so how long do you think it's practical to to keep some yeast hanging around in the fridge? Well, I, I think um, on on the plates, um, I, I think you know six months is is probably a, a good time period um i've noticed on on mine they're starting to get a little bit older some of the colonies are starting to get a little big and starting to merge into each other so sometime soon i'm going to to re-streak some plates just to to start new um but they can they can stay for for quite a while on the the plates and i would i would say most likely they'll last longer than than a mason jar um because they're not sitting in alcohol, mm-hmm. they're they're just sitting on their little media, sort of slowly working away. But but they're not, you know, sort of sitting in their own waste products. So over over time, in the mason jar, those yeasts are going to be more likely to become dormant and lose some viability, and and you know probably a little more risk of of getting an unknown contaminant into that mason jar also. But that being said, if you can grow something out of it, and it tastes good. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I, I can attest that, uh, and I don't know if the, the listeners have seen uh, discussion on the basic brewing video of the uh, zombie Belgian yeast that uh, that I cultured up that was uh, from a few tubes of White Labs yeast that were several years old. Uh, if there is, if you can find some sludge, you know, some some yeast sludge. There may be a few cells in there that you could nurture back to health and and uh, you know get a pitchable amount. But you, because the yeast has been stressed for that long, you really don't know what you're what you're going to come out with, right? Yeah, that that's true. I mean, it will change over time, and having having the yeast on a on a solid media, you'll stay with more with your original culture than if you you have it sitting in a mason jar or an old bottle of homebrew. Um, <laughs> but change is not always bad unless you're trying to sell it, and then maybe it is. Well, that's true. You might come up with something that's, uh, you know, that's interesting. Uh, ben from London asks, other than making a starter, how do you check viability? I, I think that's that's really the... The way to do it is to um, to make starters, um, but like I said, I, I will start with a little 10 ml starter, so it's a pretty easy thing to do. And within, you know, certainly within a day, if I'm not seeing fermentation, I know I, I have a problem. Mm-hmm. And what do you do at that point? Do you just throw the whole petri dish away, or do you try it again with another uh, with another sample? Well, so, so far I haven't run into that problem, uh, so <laughs> hopefully I won't. But I would, I would probably look for for other colonies on there and see what I could grow up. Um, I guess, you know, I would be worried if I started seeing that my um, petri dish looked that the plate looked dried out, um, because if it dries out, that's that's probably going to kill those yeast. Um, 
but you know if it's if it's moist and and they look like they've have the same appearance that they've had all along it's it's probably pretty good and that's that's the nice thing about this um if they do go bad it's pretty easy to get new yeast and start fresh mm -hmm. now the one one handy thing that this technique uh, can help you with is if you uh enjoy a particular uh a particular beer you know like a hefeweizen or something like that that's bottle conditioned you can you can get that yeast and uh you know have it for yourself essentially yeah that that's true and i haven't haven't done that yet um but i i've heard about a lot of people doing that and that's certainly something interesting to do i'm actually planning on on trying to see if i can recover anything from some 15 year old barley wine that i found hidden away in my parents basement mm -hmm. and i have no idea what yeast was in it i'm kind of thinking it may have been a champagne yeast but that is one of my next little pet projects to see if i can recover anything out of it and then try to brew with it well, kind of an archaeological expedition there. <laughs> it, it might be. <laughs> so, the, is there uh, are there any tips as to what yeast that you may not want to culture? Um, I think culturing anything anything that interests you, um, go for it. Um, I'm not sure. Um, about culturing a brett, that's not something I've I've worked with, um, so I'm not sure how that would would work. And, and you might want to keep that separate from your your other cultures to try to make sure you don't have contamination um, from it. But I think if it ferments, you can probably culture it. Mm -hmm. I got a question from Tom. Any tips on um, ranching wild wild yeast uh, for a lambic? Or a Berliner Weiss. So a la lambic's kind of a different animal, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're probably talking more with with the wild fermentation about there probably being a, a variety of different critters in there, and you know maybe a couple different yeasts and and maybe even some bacterial fermentations. Uh, so I think using a a plate technique like I've been doing wouldn't work so well because those are really designed to isolate uh, single strains. So if you have a, a multi-strain fermentation, um, you might be able to isolate each strain out of it, but recreating that, that fermentation would be would be difficult. Mm -hmm. But if, if I had something like that that I, I like, that would be one I would encourage someone to try to keep going in a, in a liquid culture in a mason jar or you know, a bottle or, or something along those lines. Yeah, essentially just pitching pitching the dregs into a starter and uh, letting the starter do its thing and then and then sticking it in the fridge and, and trying to keep that uh, going in sort of the similar way that you're using the plates, right? Right, right. But that, you know, that would help keep, you know, a variety of different, different uh, strains going at, at the same time. That's and that's when I think... It, it might be hard to recreate because I think your mix would change over time because some of them would be, some things would be more viable during that storage than, than others. So I think you probably would experience change over time. That's, that's a good point. Uh, got a couple of questions about yeast washing. And uh, I've had a little experience with, with uh, yeast washing just with uh, sanit or sterilized or sanitized water. Uh, have you gone that route? I've never, I've never, never done that. Um, I've only a, a couple of times put some some fresh warts onto old yeast cakes, um, and and that's worked pretty well. Um, um, but for the most part, I've always just made up new starters. In in terms of culturing the yeast out onto to plates, I don't think that washing is is really something you need to do um, because the washing process is really helping get rid of um, get rid of some of that trube, you know, any hop residue, dead yeast cells, and you know, with the with the culture, with the little loop you're using to get it onto a plate, you're not gonna you're not gonna pick up a lot of hop residue. Um, the the non viable cells 
aren't going to really affect anything, and you're just going to grow up those individual viable cells, and you'll be able to isolate the, the good ones from any potential contamination. So for, for culturing it, I, I don't think the washing's a, a necessary step. What doesn't grow is not going to hurt you, and what does grow is hopefully good yeast, right? On, on the <laughs> That's the plan. <laughs> Well, I, I've been able to keep uh, one batch of, uh, I think it was White Labs uh, California Ale used to go on for like uh, six or seven batches of beer by, you know, abusing it in one way or the other, either pitching, uh, you know, new fresh wort on the yeast cake or, or by washing with uh, um, uh, with water the way it used to say on the White Lab site, but they've taken that page down. It's essentially... Uh, essentially, the technique that they uh, advocated was um, uh, taking two sanitized containers, of course, and then boiled and cooled water uh, that's been refrigerated, and you essentially uh, rinse the yeast back and forth between those uh, sanitized containers, uh, and essentially the, the, the yeast that stays in suspension uh, is the good stuff and the and the uh, theoretically the stuff that uh, f- settles in layers at the bottom is is mostly either dead stuff or you know dormant stuff so uh, I mean that's the that's the thirty thousand uh, feet description of the <laughs> of the yeast <laughs> washing technique that I've used but one thing that uh, that you open yourself up to when you do that kind of thing is that you're exposing your yeast to air more and you're exposing you know every surface new surface that your yeast solution touches uh, has uh, potential contaminants on it and so it is kind of adding some risk uh, in there as well whereas uh, if you flame a loop and uh, you know you do uh, you scratch it onto a, a sterile uh, uh, agar solution <clears throat> you're you're going to be a bit more safe, right? Yeah, I think I think you probably have lower lower risk um, with with just using the loop, and also with getting it onto a, a plate. If if you do pick up a little contaminant, you can probably separate it out from your good cells. So mm-hmm. you know, if you have a contaminant, you can you can grab something that looks good and just take that and, and put it onto a new plate and and be working with something pure. Is there anything that uh, is there anything that we've missed in the process that you think is is essential for somebody who's who's trying this from scratch? Well, I think the relax, don't worry, have a homebrew is very important. <laughs> but um, really, it 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 comes down to um, just having you know. Uh, a little bit of an idea of, of some sterile technique, um, just you know, keeping things clean and, and sanitized, and, and you know, sterilized if you can. And, and I do have access to an autoclave, which is nice, but but pressure cookers will work just fine. Um, and a, a little bit of research. I had listened to your your show. Uh, I think last year it was, and there's some good information in the Tech Talk archives. And I got a little booklet from White Labs that I believe is called a fungus among us, <laughs> and uh, and it's it's pretty easy to do. I was a little bit hesitant to, at first, um, but once I once I got going, I realized it's it's pretty straightforward and and kind of an entertaining way to spend my time. There you go. For me, it's kind of like all green brewing. You know, it was kind of scary until I did it, and it was like, "Hey, well, that's not so bad." <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much how it is. It it sounds kind of scary, um, but once you start doing it, it's it's not too big a deal. And uh, you know, as long as you're not too worried about it, it's probably going to come out okay. Well, there you go. Words words from words from the wise, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Greg, uh, we will be following your your progress on your on your blog, and I'll put a link out to your blog on, in the description of this episode out there on on uh, basicbrewingradio.com. And Great. I thank you, James. I appreciate your time and and good luck. All right. Well, I will keep everybody 
posted, and we'll see what sort of uh, fun stuff we grow up. <laughs> thanks, Greg. <laughs> Bye-bye. Well, thanks again to Greg. Once again, I'll post a link to his blog on basicbrewingradio.com in the description of this episode. It'll be fun to follow as he builds up his collection of yeast. And uh, I may I may get into it too, doggone it. The yeast in the bottom of the uh, last surviving zombie Belgian is calling to me to save them for yet another batch. If you have any brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. You can check out our homebrewing DVDs, Introduction to Extract Homebrewing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits on our site. We've got uh, new combo deals, not new combo deals, but we've got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. We've got shirts, including our Go Forth and Flocculate shirt and shirts of different colors. And we're working on another one. Another shirt coming up by award-winning designer, hopefully. Uh, So stay tuned for that. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Celestron Skymaster Giant 15 by 70 binoculars with tripod adapter and Helping Hands with Magnifying Glass. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We appreciate your support. And uh, also, don't forget, we've got the uh, uh, associate links for the American Homebrewers Association and Brew Your Own Magazine out there on the site as well. That's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by our buddy... Kelly Dotson down there in Austin, Texas, where they do real ranching around there. Well, not in Austin, but, you know, in Texas. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. Music